which is on page 796. How like a winter hath my absence been from thee, the pleasure of the fleeting year? What freezings have I felt? What dark days seen? Lost my place. Uh, what old December's barrenness everywhere? And yet this time removed was summer's time, the teeming autumn big with rich increase, bearing the wanton burden of the prime, like widowed wombs after their lord's decease. Yet this abundant issue seemed to me but hope of orphans and unfathered fruit, for summer and his pleasures wait on thee, and thou away, the very birds are mute. Or if they sing, tis with so dull a cheer that leaves look pale, dreading the winter's near. Okay. The previous two sonnets, if you remember, 93 and 94, 93 the speaker said, I'm going to suppose that you're faithful, even though I think that you've actually been cheating on me. And then 94 suggests that the beloved is still cheating. Okay. When the speaker says... Um, you know, that your eyes move others, etc., but you're unmoved, you're still a stone, and, and such. And then you finish with that final couplet about festering lilies. 97 changes the attitude that we saw in those earlier two sonnets. How? What do we see being expressed by the speaker? Why? He is sad, but why? I guess they're not together. Yes. There's a, that's some kind of separation has occurred. How like a winter hath my absence been from thee? Why winter? Why not summer? She was his sunshine. She was his sunshine. She was his light. She was his greenness. Winter is symbolic of death. Okay. The pleasure of the fleeting year. That is, the, comma, and then you get this big, long, a positive phrase. And a positive phrase describes the thing just before the comma. She, or the the, is the pleasure of the fleeting year. What freezings have I felt? This is all Petrarchan convention. What dark day seen? What old December's barrenness everywhere? When? Now that the two of them have been separated, okay? And yet this time removed, that is the time of my absence, was summer's time. That is the time of my absence of you, however, was summer time. The teeming autumn, big with rich increase, great with, about to give birth, possible innuendo there. Bearing the wanton burden of the prime, okay? Burden, contents of a womb, prime, spring. Meaning something has gone on with the relationship that caused, okay, the imagery of regeneration going on here or the imagery of propagation going on here. Yet this abundant issue, that is offspring, seemed to me but hope of orphans. Hope of orphans. Does that mean that it would result in orphans? Or the hope of orphans? That is, whatever the hope is that orphans have. What hopes do orphans have? Few, if any. Few, if any. Parents, to go off and make their own way. Parents, to go off and make their own way. To be accepted <coughs> into a family. Okay. To experience love, but hope of orphans and unfathered fruit. Well, how in the world can you have unfathered fruit? Okay. For summer and his pleasures wait on thee. Meaning serve. Your gloss says hold themselves in abeyance until you are present. Yes. But it also means they serve thee, so that the wherever the thee is, that is where summer and its pleasures are. So if the thee is separate from me, the speaker, then I'm not where summer and its pleasures are. And thou away, 
the very birds are mute, as in winter. Oh, okay, maybe they do sing. Or if they sing, tis with so dull a cheer that leaves look pale, dreading the winter's near. What kind of winter? Remember, remember, uh, number 73, that time of year thou mayst in me behold. Okay, the winter of our separation is being implied. Now look at 98. 97 is largely about some kind of winter, a metaphorical winter. 98, from you have I been absent in the spring. When proud pied April, dressed in all his trim, hath put a spirit of youth in everything, that heavy Saturn laughed and leaped with him. Yet nor the lays of birds, nor the sweet smell of different flowers, in odor and in hue, could make me any summer story tell, or from their proud lap pluck them where they grew. Nor did I wonder at the lilies white, nor praise the deep vermilion in the rose. They were but sweet, but figures of delight, drawn after you, pattern of all those. Okay? Don't want to do the couple yet. He says, I've been absent from you in the spring. And then he goes on, the speaker goes on, and describes the kinds of flowers seen and enjoyed in spring. Is the speaker talking about literal flowers? So what are the flowers then representative of? Purity and passion. Other women. Okay. Look at what he says again. Uh, I did, nor did I wonder at the lilies white, nor praise the deep vermilion in the rose. They, they were sweet, but they were figures of delight. That is, the lilies white, the vermilion rose, weren't real lily and rose. They were images of. Like if you pull out your wallet or purse and you have a photograph of a loved one in there. That's not the real loved one. That's an image. The real loved one is off somewhere else right now. Okay? Yet seemed it winter still and you away as with your shadow I with these did play. So what's the speaker just said? And so what did he do while she was away? Or while the beloved was away? Pretended. In other words, no, 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 no. I wasn't off having fun with them, whoever the them is. Okay. He says, no. I was off having fun with mere images of you. Okay, so is this convincing? Is this a way of saying... No, like, um, you know, the Willie Nelson song, All the Women I've Loved Before. The import of that is, if you take that in a platonic context, or if you, if, if you were to take that Willie Nelson song and transport it back into Shakespeare's day, what the next line would be is, all the women I loved before were but leading me to you. You are the sum and total of all womanhood. It's kind of a subtle way of saying, yeah, I haven't been faithful to you, but I've been trying. I've been looking for you in all the wrong places, so to speak. All right? Go. It's like Smokey Robinson's song. It's either tears of the clown or tracks of my tears. Yeah. I'm, I'm, at, I'm out there with the girls acting happy, but deep inside I'm crying. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I really don't enjoy what I'm doing, but, you know. Um, go from there to 105. Let not my love be called idolatry, nor my beloved as an idol show. Why? Because idolatry is wrong. Worshiping an idol is wrong. Since all alike... 
My songs and praises be to one of one, still such, and ever so. Now the speaker has just said, all my songs and all my praises are about one individual. But don't let my beloved be called idolatry. Kind is my love today, tomorrow kind. Still constant in a wondrous excellence. Therefore, my verse to constancy confined. Why is the verse to constancy confined? Because the verse is to one, of one, still such, and ever so. It is always about the one being described. Therefore, the verse is to constancy confined because kind is my love today, tomorrow kind. She or he is constant today and tomorrow will be constant. Therefore, my verse to constancy confined. One thing expressing leaves out difference. My verse expresses only one thing. What's that? It's the word he's just repeated, or the word he's just used in the previous line. Constancy. So if the verse is all about constancy, it expresses one thing, and therefore it leaves out difference. Because you can't have constancy and difference in the same poem. Because difference means obviously what? Inconstancy. If it's different, it is different than. Okay? Fair, kind, and true is all my argument. That is, this is the sum and theme of everything I write about. Fair, kind, and true. Fair, kind, and true, varying to other words, that is, I put fair, kind, and true in other words, and in this change is my invention spent, my invention. My ability to come up with new ways, essentially, of saying the same thing. Okay? The gloss. My inventiveness is used up in finding other words to express, to express the same thought. The same thought being fair, kind, and true. Okay? Three themes in one. Which wondrous scope affords. Wonder scope. It means... Kind of everything is my palette to choose from. If I'm going to write about fair, kind, and true, I can write about the world. But he's not writing about the world. He's writing about what? The. <laughs> okay. Fair, kind, and true have often lived alone, which three till now never kept seat in one. He's essentially saying, you know, maybe in the past, fair kept seat in Julia, kind kept seat in uh, Sarah, and true kept seat in Karen. But Julia, unfortunately, was not also kind and true. And Sarah wasn't fair and true, and Karen wasn't fair and kind. Or maybe some of them did have two of them, but he's saying, up until now, no one has ever been all three. Fair, which means beautiful, kind, which means natural, and true, which means Faithful or constant. Okay. The speaker is saying, My beloved is this. And never before has anyone been this. So she's like something new in the world, or he, if you want. Okay. Launch. Yeah. All right, 106. I love this poem. This is really beautiful. 
When in the chronicle of wasted time I see descriptions of the fairest whites in beauty making beautiful old rhyme in praise of ladies dead and lovely knights. Then in the blazon of sweet beauty's best of hand, of foot, of lip, of eye, of brow I see their antic pen would have expressed even such a beauty as you master now. Just stop there for a moment, the first eight lines. When in the chronicle of wasted time, your gloss tells you time gone by with chronicles suggesting previous eras or olden times. No, it's not what it means. The chronicle of wasted time means the chronicles of the old past times. Well, what are the chronicles of the old past times? The literary products. The written material that survives from the old past times. And what do we see in those products? Think of Canterbury Tales. Think of Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. Think of Lonval. All of which have beautiful women, handsome men, famous knights. I see descriptions of the fairest whites. Again, the most beautiful people. And beauty making beautiful old rhyme. That is, the beauty of the people makes the old rhymes, the old tales, the old stories beautiful. In praise of ladies dead and lovely knights. Okay? None of these people are still alive. None of these people are still around. Then, he says, when I see these descriptions, then in the blazon of sweet beauty's best, that is, in the blazon of all those characteristics that make up what was considered beautiful, of hand, of foot, of lip, of eye, of brow, I see their antic pen, notice how I'm pronouncing that, by the way, would have expressed even such a beauty as you master now. Why antic and why not antique? Okay. One, because of the meter, and tick. Syllable stress on the first one rather than antique, second one. Two, antic, which is the proper Elizabethan pronunciation, also suggests two possible meanings. Antique, meaning very old, as well as antic, somewhat frenzied. Okay. I see their antic pen. Why would the pen be somewhat frenzied? Because poets often writing of love are writing in a frenzy. Okay. See, um, for example, see Duke Theseus' speech in Act 5 of Midsummer Night's Dream when he's talking about lovers, madmen, and poets have such antic brains. And he talks about how lovers, madmen, and poets are very similar in that they see things that aren't really there, they express things that aren't really there, etc. It's one of the, I think, one of the best speeches in all of Shakespeare because Shakespeare is telling us something there, I think at least, about what he, as a poet, thinks of poetic creation, literary creation and what it means, okay? So, he says, all their praises are but prophecies. All the praises in these old chronicles of time, he says, are prophecies. Why? Because look at the previous line. What did they do? They described even such a beauty as you master now. So they were forward-looking to you. So all their praises are but prophecies of this our time, all you prefiguring. And for they looked but with divining eyes, that is, they looked with eyes that they didn't physically see the beauty that they're discussing. It was divine, it was divination, looking into the future, so to speak. 
They had not skill enough your worth to sing. They did not have skill, the ability to choose this word over that word, to find the right words to describe your worth. Conclusion. For we, which now behold these present days, we now which possess, which own, and which see these present days, have eyes to wonder, but lack tongues to praise. That is, we can see and be filled with awe, but unlike those antic poets, we lack tongues to praise. Why do they lack tongues to praise? And, and look at what he's juxtaposing. He's juxtaposing, we have the eyes to actually see the real beauty, but we don't have the tongues to give the praise. The previous writers in Chronicles of Wasted Time, they didn't have the eyes to see, but they had the tongues to praise. So why do we not have, in the present time, tongues to praise? Well, either we're not as good as they were, or we're just so astonished. It's the latter. Okay. It's words fail. Words don't express the beauty of the individual being described. Okay? Go from there to 116. Probably the most famous of Shakespeare's sonnets. Back in the 70s, this poem was used a lot in wedding ceremonies because it's so beautiful. Okay? Let me not, let me back up. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. And one thing I haven't talked about at all is notice Shakespeare's punctuation, or notice the punctuation, I should say, in the sonnets. Because again, we don't know if it's Shakespeare's or not. Okay? We don't have any manuscripts. We don't know if Shakespeare wanted these things published or not. But you get that run-on sentence there. And by run-on, I don't mean, you know, uh, run-on as in grammatical. It's run-on. It goes over past the line, end, and goes into the middle of the next line, and then ends. So you have to read it fluidly. You don't put a pause at the end of minds. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. Okay, the period there, long pause. He's just kind of concluded a main idea or a sentence. Oh no. It is an ever-fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark whose worth's unknown, although his height be taken. And I'll come back and talk about what some of these images mean. Love's not time's fool. The rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. Okay, hold off on the final couplet. Go back to the beginning. Let me not, to the marriage of true minds, admit impediments. What's being married? Minds. 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 Okay, And what Shakespeare is doing in those opening lines is he's playing off the wedding bands or the marriage bands. B-A-N-S, not B-A-N-D-S. Okay, Which in Elizabethan uh, England, and your footnote mentions this a little bit, in the actual wedding service you have those lines. If any of you know cause or just impediment, why these two persons should not be joined together in holy matrimony, Ye are to declare it. Okay? That's in the actual wedding service in the Book of Common Prayer. But you had also what were called the marriage bands, which was for three consecutive weeks up to the date of marriage, 
the rector or priest in the church would announce to from the pulpit to the congregation, so and so are being married on such and such date. If anyone have any cause for why this marriage should not take place, let him speak now. And he would do that for three successive Sundays. So that on the wedding day, when these lines are read, no one should have cause to stand up and stop the marriage. Okay? We know for a fact the bans were not read before Shakespeare's wedding to Anne Hathaway for the simple reason she was pregnant. Okay? So, let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediment. Now, notice what is also interesting about this, this description. They are true minds. True to each other. What does true mean? It doesn't mean not false. Literally, it means upright. It means straight. Like when a tire, a bicycle tire is true. Okay? It's perfectly vertical. It doesn't have any thing like that, which if you know anything about bicycle tires, if your spokes break, or some of them are break, uh, break or are loose, the tire will start to go out of true and will have that kind of shape, okay? So let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. This is the speaker. Who might be being married? The youth and the golden-haired, uh, the dark lady? We don't know yet, or we don't know. Love is not love, which alters when it alteration finds. What does that mean? I mean, the love is not love, that's pretty clear. But what about which alters when it alteration finds? That is, if you truly love someone, some change in them is going to change your love. Bingo. Or, some change in you is not going to change your love. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds. So, if I love my wife, according to the love that is being described here, if I love my wife and she alters, if her gaze turns elsewhere, let's say, okay, then the only way my love is really love is if I do not love her any the less. Now, think about that for a bit. That's a pretty powerful statement. Okay? Or bends with the remover to remove. That is, or bends. Okay, keep in mind, bend would mean this. It's no longer true. Or bends with the remover. Okay? True mind. Here's true mind A. Here's true mind B. What are they true in relation to each other. So what happens when B is no longer true or bends with the remover to remove? That is, if this one bends with this, it doesn't mean that it is still true in relation to that. It means no. What was true love is now shattered. It is destroyed. So, in order for this love to still be true, the love of this individual for this individual must not change. Even though this individual's love has what? Bent away. It has declined. No. It is an ever Fixed mark. And I don't know why your text doesn't have it, but that should read like that. Fix it. Okay? 
It is an ever-fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. Well, how does it look on tempests? Well, where are tempests? Tempests are storms. Predominantly, storms in the ocean. So the ever-fixed mark is up above. It looks down on the storms. It sees the storms happening, but it's not affected by the storms. And he's going to tell us exactly what that ever-fixed mark is. It is the star to every wandering bark. What star? Well, if you're in the northern hemisphere, Polaris, it's the north star. It's the one star a mariner has to be able to see to really get his full bearings. If you're in the southern hemisphere, it's the southern cross that you need to be able to see. Okay? It's the star to every wandering bark whose worth's unknown worth, inherent value, although his height be taken. That is, using a sextant and figuring out the azimuth of where the star is, the degrees of the star above the horizon, to be able to use that to determine your latitude. Okay? Love's not time's fool. Notice that. So love does, love does not do what? Well, we just grew out of love. No. Shakespeare says, love's not time's fool. And by fool, what he really means is plaything. Though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickles compass come. That is, I mean, that is just one of the most amazing lines when you think about it. Within his bending sickles compass come. What's a sickle look like? It's generally like that. Sometimes you'll find them with a curved handle, etc. But it's like a scythe that you use to cut wheat and tall grass with. But look at the language he uses. Rosy cheeks and lips come within its, to a full circle, its compass. They come within it's circumference, meaning here you are in the middle of your time and rosy cheeks and lips are going to come in and out and in and out and in and out. And what are they doing? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. But love's not time's fool, meaning even though those rosy lips and cheeks will come into time's compass, love doesn't. Love doesn't get cut off. No. Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. The end of of time, or judgment day, if you want, okay? It's pretty powerful stuff. The speaker is saying, essentially, I will love you no matter what you do. Even if you go off chasing others, I will love you. I will be true to you. I will be faithful. Others may come within my orbit. I will not go after them. If this be error. Notice what the, the question, the if, presupposes. Okay. Or this is, if, if we looked at this from kind of a classical rhetoric thing, this is Shakespeare suggesting the possible refutation of his argument. You know, like, imagine this is a guy talking to his girlfriend. And she's sitting there going, yeah, right. You know, you say you love me, but some swimsuit model comes in and your eyes don't immediately go over there. Yeah, right. If this be error, that is, if I'm wrong, 
And it's proved on me, I never read nor no man ever loved. If this is wrong, and you can prove it to me, then I never wrote. And no man has ever loved. Okay. What's his coup de grace there? He's clearly, He's clearly written. The poem's right in front of you. Okay. So that means at least one man has loved. That's a pretty profound poem when you unpack it like that. Um, now we can skip, well, one. <laughs> Go to 127. And this is really the, this is the first or second of the sonnets that deal with the dark lady. In the old age, that is the pre-Elizabethan age, in the old age, black was not counted fair. It was not seen as fair or beautiful. Or if it were, it bore not beauty's name. That is, or if people did consider it to be the same as beautiful, they didn't call it that. But now is black beauty's successive heir. That is, now, in our day, black is considered beautiful. And beauty is slandered with a bastard shame. Look at your gloss there. The former fair conception of beauty has been discredited as illegitimate and false. Well, what was the former one? It's that whole total white image. For since each hand can put on nature's power, meaning you can Maybelline yourself, you know, you can go from being not attractive to extremely attractive. For since each hand hath put on nature's power, fairing the foul with art's false borrowed face. You just have to wonder what Shakespeare would think of, you know, plastic surgery. <laughs> Sweet beauty hath no name, no holy bower but is profaned, if not lives in disgrace. And I think by what he means by sweet beauty, it's natural beauty, innate beauty. Therefore, that is, if you take the premises of those first eight lines as being true, therefore, my mistress's eyes are raven black. Her eyes so suited, and they mourners seem at such who not born fair, no beauty lack. Okay? If you're not born fair, no beauty lack. Who, your gloss says, lacking natural beauty have acquired it artificially, or who, not being of fair coloration, are in accord with current ideals of beauty. That is, if they're not born very lightly complected, like, you know, someone from northern Finland, okay, just really, really white skin. And such you not born fair, no beauty like. Slandering creation with a false esteem. Esteem, a false face, a false hue, let's say. Oh. Uh, Yet so they mourn. They who? His lover's eyes? Yet so they mourn, becoming of their woe. That is, fitting their woe. That every tongue says beauty should look so. So we get this emphasis on now, in the new age, darkness, blackness is considered beauty. Okay. Go from there to 129, and then we'll do 130, which is Shakespeare's employment of the false blazon, of the um, anti blazon. 129. <clears throat> the expense of spirit and a waste of shame is lust in action. Until action, 
Lust is perjured, murderous, bloody, full of blame. Savage, extreme, rude, cruel, not to trust. Enjoyed no sooner, but despised straight. Past reason hunted, and no sooner had past reason hated as a swallowed bait. On purpose laid to make the taker mad. Mad in pursuit and in possession so. Had having and in quest to have extreme. A bliss in proof. Improved a very woe. Before a joy proposed. Behind a dream. All this the world well knows. Yet none knows well to shun the heaven that leads men to this hell. The expense of spirit and a waste of shame is lust in action. Okay, your gloss there for waste is idiotic in my opinion. Because what else would it mean on a literal level? But there ought to be a gloss there. Suggesting Shakespeare also punning on W-A-I-S-T. The expense of spirit. What? How do you expend your spirit? Well, in the Renaissance, it was a commonplace notion that every time you experienced an orgasm in sex, you died a little bit. And if you die a little bit, that's an expense of spirit. An expense of spirit in a waste of shame is lust in action. Okay, It's lust. Notice, it's not love. Huge difference. Because he's going to tell us what lust means. Until action, that is, until it is performed. Until it is carried out, until it leaves the mind and comes out into the real wor world through the body, lust is perjured. <laughs> it's a lie. It's not real. It's murderous. Murderous of what? The self. It's bloody because of the passions that are enraged. It's full of blame. It's savage. It's extreme. It's rude. It's cruel. It's not to be trusted. That's what not to trust means. Why? Because once it's trusted, once it is enjoyed, enjoyed no sooner but despised straight. How many of you have seen the movie Hitch? Okay? Remember the real disgusting guy? Can't remember his name. The guy who's trying to get what's her name's girlfriend, her friend, into bed. And he finally gets her into bed, and when Hitch me meets, meets him, he says, you know, all this for a lousy lay. It's exactly what that means. He goes through hoops to get Kaylee, Kylie, whatever her name is, into the sack, and once he does... Enjoyed no sooner, but despised straight. Past reason hunted. And if we aren't this individual ourselves, we know people who are like this, who will do everything to fulfill whatever that desire is. I mean, here it's specifically a sexual desire, but it doesn't have to be. Past reason hunted, meaning it's madness. It's lunacy. And no sooner had past reason hated as what? A swallowed bait. Because what does every piece of swallowed bait have with it? A hook. It's the hook. Because what does the hook mean in this context? Once more. Yeah. On purpose laid. Yes, Shakespeare is punning there. The purpose is to get laid. On purpose laid to make the taker mad. And he's probably, 
in one edition I have, uh, the annotator suggests Shakespeare is talking about venereal disease here, that you can become mad from taking the bait. Mad in pursuit. Again, why? Because it's beyond reason. And in possession so. Having gotten the bait, having accomplished the lust, one is then in possession of madness. Had, having, and in quest to have, extreme. Okay, Nothing in extremes is good within the context of the sonnets. It is a bliss in proof. And your gloss tells you experience. Yes and no. What proof really means is in the proving of it. And proving there means testing. The testing of the lust. That's not the looking forward. That is the immediate satisfaction of it. And proved a very woe. Before a joy proposed. It's an idea. It's an ideal. I mean, look at modern society tells, says about sex that it's the absolute greatest thing. It's the end all and be all of existence. Not quite. <laughs> Behind, that is, once it's been achieved, it's a dream. Why a joy proposed a dream? What is it about dreams? They're fleeting. Never as good as they seem. Not real. <laughs> They're never real. All this the world well knows. Notice, not all this I well know. The speaker is saying, everybody knows this is true. This is a, a generalization for all of humanity. This is a universal truth. Yet none knows well to shun the heaven that leads men to this hell. Everybody knows this is true, but nobody knows how to say no. Okay, And what's this hell? Go back to the first line. The expense of spirit and a waste of shame. This is the hell. Okay. 130. Sting ripped this off for the title of an album and for a song. Back in about 1985-86. My mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. Coral is far more red than her lips red. Okay. This is the poem that the entire thing is an anti-blazon. If a blazon is the cataloging of the lover's beauties according to mapping out her physical body or face or features, this is the opposite. Okay, It is a mapping out, but not according to beauty. So, my mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. Coral is far more red than her lips red. If snow be white, why then her breasts are done. If hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. I have seen roses damasked red and white. But no such roses see I in her cheeks. And in some perfumes is there more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. <laughs> it's, just, it's just about my favorite line in all of Shakespeare. I love to hear her speak. Yet well I know that music hath a far more pleasing sound. I grant I never saw a goddess go. My mistress, when she walks, treads on the ground. Yeah, let's stop there for a minute. Go back to the first couple of lines. Okay. Her eyes are nothing like the sun, meaning her eyes aren't shining bright. If they're nothing like the sun, that's an indication of opposition. They're the opposite to the sun. They're pitch black. 
Coral is far more red than her lips red. What would Shakespeare's experience of coral have been? Where does coral exist? Where in the ocean? Tropics. Where is England in relation to the tropics? Not. <laughs> it's not. Okay. It's several thousand miles north of the tropics. What happens to coral when you pull it out of the ocean? It fades to what color? If you have it out long enough, it bleaches to white. Coral is far more red than her lips red. Now, he's not talking about this nice, deep red. He's not even, I think, talking about this nice kind of light pinkish tone. I think he sees a piece of white coral, and he says, that coral is redder than my girlfriend's lips. So what's he saying about her lips? Yikes, you know. <laughs> if snow be white, why then her breasts are done. What color is done? Bre ish. Kind of tannish, beige-ish. Think dirty dishwater. I mean, wash some dirty clothes or wash some dirty dishes. Let the, you know, Subsides fade away and look at that water. That's what he's saying is the color of her breasts. Ew. <laughs> it's just not an attractive image any way you look at it. If hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. Think of a. It is funny. Think of, you know, Witch Broom Hilda if you're familiar with the cartoon. And her hair is kind of sticking out like that. I have seen roses damasked, red and white. That is multicolored roses. But no such roses see I in her cheeks. Meaning, he doesn't see red or white in her cheeks. So are her cheeks dull? No. It's because he doesn't see white in her cheeks. Why? She's not white. That's why. That's the whole import of this poem. And in some perfumes is there more, I just love these two lines. In some perfumes is there more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. The word reeks applied to a person is never positive. You know, <laughs> you pick up your girlfriend for the night, oh honey, you reek beautifully tonight. <laughs> Whack, you know, <laughs> girlfriend no more, you know. I love to hear her speak, yet well I know music hath a far more pleasing sound. See, normally the beloved's voice would be compared to music. Her voice is, I don't know, Fran Drescher, the nanny, or somebody like that. I grant I never saw a goddess go meaning walk. And what he's doing there is he's comparing his girlfriend, let's say, or his beloved with all the other beloveds of sonnet sequences. Because in the vast majority of them, at one point or another, the speaker will compare his beloved to Venus, to Aphrodite, to some other goddess, or will say, not in comparison, she is a goddess. I grant I never saw a goddess go. My mistress, when she walked, treads on the ground. And he's saying two things there. One, she's real. She is a real physical flesh and blood individual. Two, she walks on the ground. Well, duh, where else would she walk? No. The implication is she's a hooker. She's a streetwalker. And yet, by heaven, that's an oath. He is swearing by God in heaven. And yet, by heaven, I think my love as rare as any she belied with false compare. 
my love. Love there is two meanings. My beloved and my love for her are as rare as any she, any other woman, be lied with false compare. All these other women that are compared to these goddesses or that are said their eyes are like the sun, their lips are like roses, their teeth are like pearls or ivory, their foreheads are like whatever, their breasts are like... He said, no, they're all belied with false compare. Why? Because none of those comparisons are actually true or correct. My lover, he says, is rare. Why? Because I haven't falsely compared her to anything. It doesn't mean that the lover's hair is really like black wires and that her lips are really like coral. Okay? He turns this whole thing on its head to say, stop with the nonsense. Stop saying your beloved is a goddess. None of us love goddesses. Take her off the footstool or off the pedestal, okay? Um, One thirty-five. Now, depending on how you read this poem, this could be one of the dirtiest poems you ever read, okay? For the simple reason that the word "will" in the poem, notice, could refer to sexual desire, and even to the genitals. So it's got at least four possible meanings here. It means, one, volition. Two, the name, will. Three, sexual desire. And four, genitalia. Whoever hath her wish, that is, whoever has her desire, her wants, Thou hast thy will, meaning her desires fulfilled, meaning her will. Notice it's capitalized there, which makes a lot of people suggest it means name. And will to boot, and will in overplus, that is in superabundance, in, in um, plenteousness. More than enough am I that vex thee still. That is, I, one can assume will, is enough to vex you in your will and will to boot and will in overplus. To thy sweet will making addition thus. Okay? I vex thee still. How? To thy sweet will making addition thus. That is, I will add to your desire my desire. I will add to your genitals my genitals. I will add to your wish, your volition, my volition. Or I will add to your wish, volition, de sexual desire, genitalia, genitalia, all of me, including the name Will. Wilt thou whose will is large and spacious, can get really dirty if you think about it. Not once vouchsafe to hide my will in thine, shall will in others seem right gracious? Shall wishes, shall volition or desires in others seem right gracious? And in my will no fair acceptance shine? What's he saying? Will you accept other wills, but not mine? Hmm. And in my will, no fair acceptance shine. The sea. And so the speaker stops with the will and says, okay, let's use a metaphor. The sea, all water, yet receives rain still. And in abundance, addeth to his store. That is, the sea already has all the water it can hold, and yet it adds even more. So thou, being rich in will, add to thy will one will of mind to make thy large will more. Let 
no unkind, meaning unnatural, no fair beseechers kill. Think all but one, and me and that one will. Think all wills but one, and me and that one will. In other words, don't worry about, if you want to read it this way, don't worry about Tom, Dick, and Harry. And Fred and George and Sam and, you know, all the... Why? Because if you have will, you've had all wills. Now, mental gymnastics is what that is. That's just sheer genius on Shakespeare's part. Okay? Uh, 135, 138... When my love swears that she is made of truth, I do believe her, though I know she lies. <laughs> you just got to love the open honesty of that, those two lines. My life, when my love swears she is made of truth, I do believe her, though I know she lies. That she might think me some untutored youth, unlearned in the world's false subtle ties. In other words, that is why I believe her, so that she will think I'm just some old dumb hick who fell off the pumpkin truck. I don't know, know nothing about no loving. And she will teach. He says that I am unlearned in the world's false subtleties. So, therefore, she can tutor him. She can learn him in the world's false subtleties. Thus vainly thinking that she thinks me young, what's the speaker just told us about her? That she's had experience. Um, yeah, that she's had experience. What else? She's vain. She thinks that she's teaching him. Is she, well, does she really? Well, Look at the line again. He doesn't have any experience, and he's looking for her because he knows she has. Okay, her. possibly. Go back to line five. Thus vainly thinking. Who's doing the thinking? She. No. Me. He is. Thus vainly thinking that she thinks me young. So he's not really young. Bingo. And he wants her to think that he's young, and yet he knows that she knows he's not young. Okay? So, vainly thinking that she thinks me young, although she knows my best days are past the best, simply I credit her false speaking tongue. Simply I credit her false speaking tongue. Why? Because she says one that she's made of truth, which is obviously false, but how else is her tongue false? Because she acknowledges that the speaker is young. Okay? He simply credits, meaning I, I simply believe what she says. Even though he knows that she's not true, and he knows that she knows he's not young. On both sides, thus is simple truth suppressed. He knows she's not true. She knows he's not young. That he's not young, what does that really mean? She knows he's not innocent. She's no, she knows he's not untutored. Okay? So what are they both doing? They're lying to each other. Or, let me rephrase that. They're lying with each other. Because keep in mind, lying has two meanings. They're lying, they're being verbally untruthful, and they are lying horizontally. But wherefore says she not she is unjust? You know, unpack that because it's a difficult, naughty, K-N-O-T-T-Y sentence. Wherefore says she not she is unjust? Why doesn't she say she is unjust? And why do I say that I'm not old? Make those positives. 
Why doesn't she say she's false? Why don't I say I'm old? Oh, love's best habit is in seeming trust. Love's best clothing, its best appearance, is to be believed true. And age and love love not to have years told. Age and one's old. Okay. Therefore I lie with her, both meanings, and she with me. And in our faults by lies we flattered be. Okay? <laughs> So basically you're saying, she says she's not a slut, I say I'm not an old coot. We both know we're lying, we're having fun, why screw me with it? It's exactly it. Look for a moment at, or not look, but let me, um, oh my guts, I did up. we're going to have to take a break. Oh, come on, dang. Anthony, let me not type it. Um, are any of you familiar with the poem The Dover Bitch by Anthony Hecht? It's his parody of um, parody of Matthew Arnold's Dover Beach. You know, which you have Matthew Arnold saying, I took a girl, we went down to Dover Beach, and he looked out at the window, and he saw the lights of France, and then he starts meditating on the sound of the ocean coming in, and then he thinks of Sophocles, and Sophocles saying, essentially, count no man happy till he's dead. Okay? This is taking too long. Because he's thinking of you know, the cosmic utility, uh, futility of life. which reads like this. The last couple lines are, are emblematic of what Shakespeare is doing in that entire sonnet. So there stood Matthew Arnold and this girl with the cliffs of England crumbling away behind them, and he said to her, try to be true to me, and I'll do the same for you. For things are bad all over, etc., etc." Well, now, I knew this girl. It's true, she'd read Sophocles in a fairly good translation and caught that bitter allusion to the sea. But all the time he was talking, she had in mind the notion of what his whiskers would feel like on the back of her neck. She told me later on that after a while she got to looking out at the lights across the channel and really felt sad, thinking of all the wine and enormous beds and blandishments and French and the perfumes. And then she got really angry to have been brought all the way down from London and then be addressed as a sort of mournful cosmic last resort. It was really tough on a girl. She was pretty. Anyway, she watched him pace the room and finger his watch chain and seemed to sweat a bit. And then she said one or two unprintable things. But you mustn't judge her by that. What I mean to say is, She's really all right. I still see her once in a while. She always treats me right. We have a drink. I give her a good time. And perhaps it's a year before I see her again. But there she is, running to fat, but dependable as they come. And sometimes I bring her a bottle of Nuit d'Amour, Night of Love. Why? Because when she goes, according to Arnold's uh, ex parody, when she goes with Matthew Arnold down to the beach, She's thinking of what? Big beds, French blandishments, and nice perfume. So he doesn't necessarily give her a big bed. He gives her a good night. Okay? And he brings her a bottle of night of love. Are they really experiencing a night of love? No. So it's very much the same as in this sonnet. Um, 
Okay, let's try and do two more. My gut will let me. Uh, do I want to do 143? Yeah, 143. Lo, as a careful housewife runs to catch, one of her feathered creatures broke away. Sets down her babe and makes all swift dispatch in pursuit of the thing she would have stay. So, this is, you know, one of the most imagistic poems Shakespeare gives us. I mean, you have a housewife who's busy. She has to put down the baby to go get a chicken or partridge or something. Whilst her neglected child holds her in chase, cries to catch her whose busy care is bent, to follow that which flies before her face, not prizing her poor infant's discontent. She's not thinking of the child. She's thinking of catching whatever the fowl is. So runst thou after that which flies from thee, whilst I, thy babe, chase thee afar behind. But if thou catch thy hope, turn back to me, and play the mother's part. Kiss me, be kind. So will I pray that thou mayst have thy will, if thou turn back and my loud crying still. Okay. This is one of the poems that tells us there's three persons involved. Okay. Because earlier in the sequence, if, if we read all of them, it would become fairly clear that here's what's happened. The speaker... Okay. has been addressing the gold-haired youth. The blonde bombshell, so to speak. Okay? And, you know, early on at least, it's telling him, go off, get married, have kids, you know, fill the, ch the world with your beautiful children, etc. And then at some point in the sequence, and I don't remember just off the top of my head, the dark lady is introduced. It's not 126, because this idea of a love triangle is brought up earlier than that, okay? But the lady, let's say, is introduced. And what you have here, my reading at least, is you have a close friendship. What you have here is a sexual relationship. And then something happens so that these two develop a sexual relationship and close friendship. Okay? And when you begin to see this, <clears throat> the speaker addressing the golden haired youth and talking about the absence. Okay, the absence, you know, and all those kinds of things, that that could be the beginning of the golden-haired youth becoming involved with the lady. Okay. And so we saw with that one, the speaker saying, I'm like that little baby whose mom runs after the bird, <laughs> okay, and crying for you, come back, come back, come back. Now look at 144. Two loves I have of comfort <coughs> and despair, which like two spirits do suggest me still. And your gloss says for suggest, tempt. Okay, And this is where the, the poet, where Shakespeare, draws this kind of diagram pretty carefully for us. The better angel is a man right fair. So we have the speaker, and he has, let's do it this way, big broad shoulders. On his right shoulder, okay, is a man right fair, the worser spirit 
a woman colored ill, meaning she's dark, okay? Of a dark or ugly complexion or temperament. To win me soon to hell, my female evil tempteth my better angel from my side. So she, notice, doesn't tempt him directly. She tempts him to essentially try to break that relationship and corrupt, would corrupt my saint to be a devil. She's trying to lead him astray, wooing his purity with her foul pride. And whether that my angel whether that my angel be turned fiend, suspect I may, yet not directly tell. Now remember the sonnets about looking at the beloved's face, and the beloved's face could never tell a lie, even though the speaker thinks the beloved's heart is elsewhere. This is what he's talking about. Okay? Um, but being both from me, both to each friend, I guess one angel in another's hell. Meaning, I guess him to be in her hell. Well, keep in mind, what was... Stay, damn it. 129. The expense of spirit and a waste of shame is lust in action. Skip down to the end. To shun the heaven that leads men to this hell. That could be his way of saying, don't go there. <laughs> you really don't want to go there. Okay? Yet this shall I ne'er know. But live in doubt. Till my bad angel fire my good one out. Look at the gloss there. Expel or reject my good angel. To fire out meant to drive someone or something away from a place by setting a fire. It also meant possibly fever with perhaps a glancing reference to venereal disease. How would he know whether or not this one had gone into the hell of this one? Same thing he comes. <laughs> if he comes back and he's got the pox. <laughs> okay? That's exactly it. Okay, uh, 147. My love is as a fever longing still for that which longer nurseth the disease. My love is as a fever longing still, that is, wanting continually. For that thing which longer nurseth the disease, that is, keeps it diseased, feeding on that which doth preserve the ill, the uncertain, sickly appetite to please. Okay, what does he mean? I'll use a very personal anecdote. I love bacon and sausage. But I've got something wrong with my gut so that whenever I eat bacon and sausage, it doesn't sit well. That's the problem right now because I had bacon last night. Okay, That's what he's talking about. Knowing something that's bad for you and yet continually <laughs> wanting it more and more and more kind of a thing. My reason, the physician to my love. Notice, reason. The doctor to my passion, meaning the correcting influence, angry that his prescriptions are not kept, hath left me. Because reason hasn't had the upper hand, he says, I've gone bonkers. Reason hath left me, and I, desperate, now approve desire is death. I approve, I know, I accept. The desire that I have, it's going to be the death of me, which physic did accept. Okay, gloss. The sexual desire objected to by my physician is deadly. 
And yet I say, kill me. <laughs> kill me more. Kill me if <clears throat> past cure I am. Now reason is past care. I am beyond cure. Why? Because reason doesn't care anymore. Well, why actually doesn't reason care anymore? Because his body is not acting properly. The head is not exerting control over the heart. The heart is in charge. Yeah. And it could be syphilis, <laughs> too. Past cure I am, no reason is past care, and frantic man was ever more unrest. Unrest, meaning ill at ease, not being, you know, constantly fidgeting and jittery and not sleeping well. All those descriptions of um, medieval concepts of lovesickness and stuff, which the Renaissance had as well. My thoughts and my discourse as madmen's are at random from the truth vainly expressed. And you've got gloss down there. Why? And the reason I say why is because he concludes with that final couplet with for, which means because. Because I have sworn the fair and thought the bright, who are as black as hell, as dark as night. I have sworn you are fair. Meaning, I've taken an oath, and I have thought. Now, obviously, we can swear things falsely. It's kind of hard to think things falsely. That is, in our own interior mind, to know something about somebody, and yet, really think the other way. And I have thought that you were bright. Meaning true, honest, fair, all those things. Who art as black as hell. It's pretty black. Dark as night. Obviously, the speaker at this point is not in a good position. Vis-a-vis -vis the beloved. Okay. All right. Let's stop there. Take about a 10-minute break. And then we'll just go on to, um, I know you probably haven't read it for today, but we'll go on to Ben Johnson. And...